गुड इवनिंग टू यू ऑल और अपॉलॉजीज फॉर बींग अटैड लेट टू बिगिन दिस प्रोग्राम इट इज़ बिकॉज ऑफ सर्टन लॉजिस्टिक प्रॉब्लम्स हेयर नॉट इन आर कंट्रोल इन वे वी आर स्टार्टिंग द प्रोग्राम नाउ एंड ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ जवाहरलाल नेहरू प्लानिटेरियम एंड आई सी टी एस वी एक्सटेंड ए वॉम वेलकम टू एवरी वन हु हैज़ जॉइंड अज इन पर्सन एट द प्लानिटेरियम हेयर एंड ऑल दोज हु हैव जॉइंड अज ऑनलाइन एंड आर वॉचिंग दिस प्रोग्राम लाइव सो इट टेक्स इमेंस प्लेजर टू वेलकम द स्पीकर ऑफ द डे प्रोफेसर रंजनी बंडोपाध्याय from raman research institute and the topic of the talk the, the copy talk is is clay a solid or a liquid so at the outset it looks like the question is uh, hardly a question it clearly clay appears to be a solid had it been that easy i'm sure professor anjani would not have given this as a time. Friends, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you, and to introduce Ranjini, who was my colleague when I was at RRI. Ranjini is a very passionate physicist, interested in soft matter and rheology and flows, and uh, she has a interest in outreach and sharing her excitement with the public. She runs a lab called the Rheology Lab, where she studies materials of the kind that you're going to hear about. So after finishing her doctorate from the Institute of Science, she went abroad to UCLA and Johns Hopkins and returned to take up a position at RRI. And now she has had a very interesting and uh, interesting career at RRI. And her uh, in the audience today, you can find her husband and daughter also here to protect to <laughs> to support her act. her uh, talk to the talk and uh, apart from worrying about the question you see on the board at work she she has another question that she worries about at home she has a cat called mew and that mew apparently is not the greek letter mew but the sound mew and one of the questions she worries about when she gets home is is a cat solid or liquid i hope one day to hear the answer to that question So Ranjini, yours. We can. Can you request? Uh, can I request Supurna to give her a memento of this event? Okay, thank you, Sam, for that very kind introduction. I think I'll go to the. Okay, no, this is fine. So, okay, so uh, I am going to talk about cats, as you would have guessed. Uh, but uh, the title of the talk is: Is clay a solid or a liquid? uh and like madhusudana ji said i mean you know there's more to it but clay here we are just using it as an example soft material now if you look at the oxford dictionary the the definition of clay is a fine granular material okay that is part that makes that basically it's a constituent of soil okay and uh, we all know of uh, clay right it's 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 a very very useful material you find clay in sediments bedrock soil it's it also has many other uses for instance uh, you use clay in, uh, for sculpting and pottery so nano composite clay so these are you have all these oil based and resin based clays so called epoxy clays and polymer clays you can make pottery out of them you can make sculpture it also has all kinds of industrial uses like fillers so uh, fillers insulators clay is a very good insulating material it's used in spark plugs uh, it is used in drilling mud as a lubricant it is also used in paper making so the sheen that you see on the surfaces of paper that is because of a very thin layer of clay that they put just to increase the to enhance the appearance of clay it's also used in chemical filtration okay so in the candles that you have in the filtration candles that you have they put clay because clay it absorbs a lot of uh, muck okay it's also it's a very good absorbent used you know it has medical uses for instance being a very good absorbent it's used to absorb microbes bacteria it's also used in diarrhea so you know that okay so now 
Okay, so now has anybody wondered what a clay molecule looks like? Does anybody know what clay, well not weak but negative uh, charges on the surfaces and some weak positive uh, charges on the rim. Okay, so there is an anisotropic distribution of charges and the picture that I have drawn here, this is for a certain kind of clay, it is a designer clay called laponite clay, it is about 25 nanometers across and 1 nanometer thick. The thickness of clay is kind of always constant across clays, but this diameter can va vary. So the clay that we find right outside, that is usually bentonite clay. So that is highly size polydispersed, which means that it can come in a range of sizes, usually between 300 nanometers and about 4 microns. Charge anisotropy. In the sense that you know there is uh, negative charges on the surface and positive on the edge. So now I am not telling you all the details. So now the charges depend on the pH, especially the charges on the edge. So we are really looking at you know alkaline pHs here. So this is what it, and yeah, please you know you can please interrupt me. And uh, so this is what it looks like. So it has you know unlike charges on the surface and on the edge. So when you put, and this happens only when you put the molecule, the macromolecule in water. Now. When you put many of these macromolecules in water, the positive charges of the rims, they interact with the negative charges on the surfaces using, uh, you know, through something called a screened electrostatic attraction, okay. And uh, this is uh, a very weak to take back with this picture is that at least clay, as in many of the other substances we will be talking about, which we can classify as that are weak, and, okay. And so, this is like I said a prototype of a soft matter. So any fragile material which means any material with a very fragile underlying structure with whose constituents they interact very weakly, we call it a soft material, okay. So there will be a lot more on this later. So now clay is not the only soft material, okay. So now if you again if you look at you know the rest of the Oxford uh, definition, it says we are going to show you all that here, why every material here is a solid as well as a liquid. Glass is also, that is a very good question, we work on glasses, I am not going to talk about glasses here. So glasses as you know structurally they are a liquid because they are disordered, but mechanically they are hard to touch, so it is a, it is a solid. And uh, so we are using clay and uh, so they make glasses as in you know they show all the properties of glasses that you would otherwise expect in say window glass for instance uh, two relaxation times so the alpha and the beta relaxation times and also you know if you can somehow uh, melt the glass okay and then you know if you quench it again it is going to start evolving into a new kind of glass this is called rejuvenation so we do all that in the lab but the difference between a soft glass and a real glass is that while the real molecular glass, it, it you know the dynamics uh, slow down when you quench the temperature really fast, here the dynamics quench, the, the, the dynamics slow down when you increase the volume fraction very fast. So these are you know these are very entropic, entropic systems, these are entropic systems. So volume fraction is inverse to the temperature in this case. Okay, so all most of the materials actually that you see around them is are soft and what I am going to try to convince you today about is that everything is soft. It just depends on what length scale you are looking at them for, okay, and, and, and what time scale over which you are looking at them. So, but you know just you know because I mean I am just repeating myself now. So these are materials that have fragile underlying structures and they are constituted by self-assembled macromolecules and they can be ruptured easily. So now if you look at a soft material at the microscopic scale, it is a disordered material. But when you kind of zoom out, you are going to see these self-assembled structures, okay. Beautiful ordering that emerges and if you zoom out even more, they also move cooperatively very much like in a glass, okay. So that is why these are such fantastic candidates for glasses. Uh, now the soft matter that I am going to talk about you today are materials that are solid as well as liquid at laboratory length scales. And what do we mean by laboratory length scales or time scales? These are length scales and time scales that we can actually measure in the laboratory. So the time scales for instance that we can measure in our laboratory, we can easily go down to less than a microsecond, okay. And 
we can go up, you know, till the lifetime of a graduate student, but then, you know, one has to be a little, well, you can't ask somebody to look at a glass for five years because students have to leave with their PhDs. So, uh, now, a soft material is called viscoelastic. I told you they were simultaneously solid as well as liquid. So, soft materials together can be elastic as well as viscous. The elasticity comes from the underlying fragile structures that I have been harping about. Okay, so the underlying structures, they have some rigidity. It is much less rigid than what you would expect for the table. But there is some rigidity and, you know, it can store energy much less. But then that is where the elasticity comes from. The viscosity of these materials, the simultaneous viscosity that we can actually measure in the lab, it comes from the fact that we can melt them or you know we can rupture the structures very easily. We can break apart the structures. Okay, sometimes as I think we will also show you later on, you know you can make a soft glass and you can actually rupture the soft glass just by shaking it with a fork. Okay, just the mechanical shaking, it is enough to melt your glass. Okay, and therefore the name soft. So, the essence of soft matter is that very, very small forces but enormous responses. You do something very tiny and the changes that you see, they are huge, okay. And I just wanted to introduce you to this word that Sam has already mentioned. So, I am, I do rheology and rheology basically is the simultaneous study of flow and deformation of a material. As you know, liquids flow and solids deform. So, we look at materials that do both, okay, at time and length scales that I already told you about. So, now um, because we are going to talk about simultaneous solids and liquids, I need young people in the audience to tell me what a solid is. So, here you see some pictures, you see a table, you see a, an ice cube that is unfortunately melting, you see glasses, this is a sodium chloride crystal, this is a tourmalin crystal, but then what do you understand by a solid? Yes? Atoms are like very hard, they are all together. They are all together, they are very close packed, right? They are all jammed together. Like liquid or gas, they all are packed. That's correct, that, that's very correct. So that is, you know, so when you have molecules that are kind of, you know, close to each other plus, you know, when the distance between them is not really changing because they are close to each other, that's called rigidity. Okay? Yeah? So, yes, now the not very young people can also answer, but not my students, please. <laughs> Anything else? Sorry? Exactly. So, they preserve their shape and obviously their volume, right? Anything else? They store energy when you apply, yeah. So, fine. So, thank you because I think you are an engineer and uh, yes. So, that is how I would define a you know, a solid that an elastic solid is something that stores energy, right? So, yes, so it is rigid and it does not flow because it is rigid. So, because you know, you have these particles like Swapnil here said, they are very close to each other, right? And they are usually interacting through some interaction. So, therefore, you know, they can't, what is flow? Flow is basically reorganizing of the molecules in a material, right? So, in a solid, the materials cannot quite move. Right, they are just held together, but in a liquid they can move and they move because you know the particles are further apart, so the interactions are weaker, so it is easier for them to rearrange, right, and to reorient. So that is the difference. And now, why is it that you know the these materials are rigid? Because when you give them some mechanical energy, they store that energy, okay, they keep that energy to themselves. So now, uh, we describe that as I many of you at least in school would have seen this, this is Hooke's law, okay. It tells you that in an elastic material force is proportional to the displacement. In other words, we write it as stress being proportional to strain, where stress is the force per unit area and the strain is the displacement that you are causing because of the, you know, the, the push that you are applying per unit length, okay. And the proportionality constant here, as many of you would know, is the spring constant. And here, this is what is called the bulk modulus or the elastic modulus. So, this capital G that you have here, or the K for that matter, it is telling you about the material, right? It's, it, it's a material that is giving you information about how elastic that material is. And then, question? No. 
Okay, so now in rheology, which is the, you know, the study of flow and deformation of matter, we normally, we represent an elastic material with a spring. Okay, so when you give it elastic potential energy, you know, it, it basically, I mean, you compress it or you uh, stretch the spring, it can store the elastic potential energy that you are giving it. Now, these are some pictures of liquids. So, you have water, you have glycerol here and you have olive oil. Okay, so these are liquids and they are very opposite to solids, yeah. Uh, volume fraction is, okay, so we are talking here about suspensions mainly. So, suspensions meaning that, you know, this has one dispersed phase and it has a dispersing phase. So, like I told you, clay is made in water, okay. So, it is the volume of clay that you put in a given volume of water. So, if you put more clay, then the volume fraction is more. If you put less clay, then the volume fraction is less. Okay, so to make a glass, for instance, you need a very large volume fraction like 54% okay, of clay in water, okay. So, uh, I hope that answers the question, okay. So, uh, now uh, liquids are just opposite to solids. So, unlike solids that are rigid, liquids flow. Liquids take the shape of the container. They retain the volume but not the shape, right, because they take the shape of the container and unlike the elastic material that stores energy, a liquid will dissipate the energy. Okay, so whatever energy you are giving it, it will instantaneously dissipate it and liquids are described by the Stoke Newton's law of viscosity which says that unlike in the, unlike you know what the Hooke's law says which is that the stress is proportional to the strain, Newton's law of viscosity says that the stress is proportional to the rate at which you are applying the strain and the proportionality constant is eta which is the coefficient of viscosity which tells you the resistance of the material to flow, okay. So, higher the viscosity, higher the eta is, the less the material wants to flow, okay. So, technically you can think of a solid as a material with infinite viscosity, okay. So, uh, and in rheology we normally, uh, we uh, depict a liquid like material with something like this which is a dashboard. So, it is uh, what the picture that you see here, the blue here is a liquid and you have a piston that is being driven through the liquid and as you are driving the piston through the liquid, you are applying some mechanical energy. That mechanical energy is immediately getting dissipated. How does the energy flow happen? Because as you are pushing the piston down, the molecules near the piston, they start reorienting, right? And they carry your mechanical energy that you have supplied to it during that reorientation process. Okay, so soft materials, is, was there a question? No, okay. Uh, so soft materials are viscoelastic. So they are called viscoelastic, why? Visco comes from the word viscosity. So that is the liquid like behavior and elastic comes from the word elasticity, that is the solid like behavior. So like I told you, these materials are simultaneously solid and liquid, yes. Here, yeah, they are viscoelastic. I am going to show you all of them, okay. So, now look at the pictures here. So, first you can just uh, focus on the left hand side column, okay. So, these are all soft materials. So, I have a, you know, like a desert here. So, that is all sand. So, why do you think sand is a soft material? Yeah, because you can walk on a beach, right? Yeah. So, that is a solid. You cannot walk on water. So. Exactly, right? Sand flows down dunes and all that. So, like Swapnil again said, so you know, so uh, this is viscoelastic because you can walk on sand, okay? You can walk on a beach, right? So, it is supporting your weight. So, that would only happen if it was a solid, it was, if it was a rigid material. Now, if I take the sand on my hand and we have a lot of sand here, we are going to have some fun with sand later. So, if I take sand on my hand here, and then if I just part my fingers, the sand is going to flow down, right, just like a liquid. And this is happening under the very weak force of gravity, right. And why does that happen? Because sand is basically, you can think of them as sub-millimeter particles and they, they, don't, they don't interact via any strong interactions really, but just by frictional forces, yes. Many small, small atoms which are, which are not connected. 
exactly thank you I mean you know this is deep yeah so you are very right. So these are only thing is you know we would not call them atoms because atoms are really tiny right. So you can think of these are scaled up atoms like zoomed out atoms right. So atoms are what they are like you know angstroms right they are but these are about uh, say 10,000 times larger. So these particles are a micron sand is even larger okay. So we will come back to much more of sand. And okay, by the way, uh, so let's you know because we are let's try to interact. So now, how many of you went to the beach recently? A wet beach early in the morning? Okay, uh, we are going to ask him now. So and it's okay if you don't have a right answer. You just have to tell me what you thought and if you remember what happened. So see, if you go to a wet beach early in the morning, the beach is wet, right? Hmm? Right. But then, have you ever noticed that when you walk on that beach, uh, your foot doesn't get wet? that you know the sand so wherever you are stepping that place becomes dry. Wondered why or does anybody know why? See that is a fantastic property that you know that you see in these uh, granular media as we call them because of the fact that they are simultaneously solid and liquid at you know time scales at which you know you are stepping okay. So this is because of anybody wants to answer? Joy. Exactly. So this is what is called Rayner's dilatancy. So then when you take materials like sand, okay, and when you, I think the mechanical engineers should know this, uh, maybe you do, but you know, do not be shy, just you know, answer. So when you walk on the beach, you are applying the weight of your whole body, right? Now when you apply weight on sand, okay, sand swells. Okay, and like I told you, they interact through just frictional contacts, which are very, very weak contacts. Now, as the sand swells, you have many pores, many gaps between the sand particles, right? So, the water on the beach that just trickles through. So, when you walk on a wet beach and you think that, you know, your, your foot feels much drier than you guessed, it is true. That is because just the fact that you are walking on it, you know, your the sand is dilating under your foot and the water is actually trickling down due to gravity, okay. So that is because of Raynor's dilatancy. Now, uh, can who can identify the material here, guesses, sorry, um, no. So this is a liquid crystal under cross polarizers. So this is you know the um, it is a soft material a bubble is also you know so many bubbles together also form soft materials and I have some bubbles of my own here which we will you know work on a little later. So this is a liquid crystal so this is the material with which you make liquid crystalline displays right. So you know it is like a so your display is really like a very flat bottle okay it is a flat transparent bottle and inside you have these liquid crystal molecules which are these tiny cigar shaped and isotropically shaped molecules okay. Now when you uh, when you so now this is the screen right the, the, the screen here is, is about 5 to 10 microns wide. Hmm? So now if you there are these tiny electric fields that are being uh, that are actually being applied here okay through uh, transparent electrodes that are made of indium tin oxide but we will not get into details and how tiny are these fields they are like a few micro volts over the micrometer you know length that you have. So that is a tiny tiny voltage. Now as a result of this voltage the liquid crystal molecules they can actually orient. They change their orientations and because the screen is between these cross polarizers that is where the colors of your screen comes from. Now the reason why liquid crystals it is a soft material is because you can actually see these colors because the force that you are applying is really an electric field that is really really tiny okay micro volts over this micrometer okay. So that is another you know example of a material where you know if you apply a very small force you get this huge response okay. Now here I have paint right we know paint. Hmm? So now you have heard of the word non drip paint why do we use non drip paint? Because see you have paint unfortunately we do not have paint today but you have paint in a can right. Now you take it out with a brush and then you you know you, you start painting your wall right. So the paint is flowing along the wall which is why the color is changing right. But then when you withdraw the brush okay ever thought why it does not drip 
because why doesn't it flow down under gravity the paint? It does not right, because the moment you withdraw the brush the paint stays there. Had it been a liquid, had it been water it would have dripped down, right, it does not. Why is that? Because paint is a soft material, it is what is called a thixotropic material which means that under the brush stroke, so when you are painting the wall you are applying a shear, okay, a push, you know, a force like this. And under that force, the viscosity of the paint comes down precipitously. The viscosity of the paint comes down by many orders of magnitude. But the moment you remove your brush, there is no shearing force on the paint anymore. And then the paint, it just solidifies on the wall. And that is why paint does not drip. And how do you do this? So paint is basically nothing but, but a mishmash of, you know, long chain polymers, you know, colorants and things like that. So they use additives to make it just the right amount of you know give it just the right amount of viscous viscoelasticity so that it has the kind of shear thinning and the shear the the shear thinning property that you need and the you know and, and also you know you need it to solidify the moment you withdraw your brush. Now look at the materials in this middle column. I have some of them. So I have a toothpaste and I have a ketchup and I have a foam right. I do not have a you know jam and a sandwich but what I want you to tell me is so apart from the fact that you know these are all uh, viscoelastic materials over here, these are all viscoelastic okay. Can you see anything common between these materials? Anything common? Okay. Okay. No, but tell me one thing you know so suppose okay so foam right. So I hope you can see this. So. Hmm, this is just normal. So, everything has come here from the supermarket. So, here solid or liquid? It is solid right because it is uh, the, the shape is retained. It is not flowing. It is not flowing. Now, uh, okay. Let me just, we have to get messy, okay. I mean, that is the only way you can do soft matter. But now, so it is a solid, right? Everybody agrees. Yeah. Now, can you make it flow? I just made it flow, right? But it did not flow on its own, right? I had to apply that little amount of energy for it to start flowing. So, the stress that I applied there, that is called an yield stress. This whole process is called yielding, okay. And I will just take one more second, which is that, see the reason, okay. You must be wondering, I mean, why is she doing all this, you know. I mean, this is crazy. Now, the reason why this is very important is because a foam is basically a laboratory scale experiment for an earthquake. Why do I say that? Because what is a foam? I will come back to your question. A foam is nothing but a very tight assembly of bubbles in a very small amount of soap solution, right. And now when I applied that force on the foam, okay, the bubbles move by a, you know, by, by, by a kind of dynamics that we call stick and slip, okay. So when you are, when I applied that force, the bubbles kind of stuck against each other and then when I exceeded a certain, you know, local stress, when some local stress was exceeded, then the the bubble slipped, okay. And many of these cooperative events, it gave rise to this, you know, solid to liquid transition that you just saw, okay. Now, stick slip, so, you know, if any of you are interested in geophysics, you will know that that is exactly how tectonic plates move in an earthquake. Now, you can't do an experiment with an earthquake, right. It is too big. It is across the, you know, the length of the world. You can do it with foam. So, there are actually papers that are written in very good journals where they have used foam as a model of an earthquake, okay. Similarly, let us see what do we have here, Colgate gel, okay. So, you would have brushed your teeth this morning, I mean, I hope, okay. So, now have you ever wondered, see, I am keeping my toothpaste here, it is not flowing out, right. What do you have to do for it to flow out? You have to give it a little squeeze, right. So, you just exceeded that yield stress. I, you had a question, I will come back to that. Yeah, exactly. So, to make these move, you are just applying that little force. See, it is not a huge force, right? 
you don't need any huge instrument or a hammer to do it. You're just doing it with, you know, you're just squeezing it with your hand and it's not much of a squeeze. Now, what is happening? See, like I told you, all these materials, by the way, they are called eel stress materials, they are soft materials. And like any soft material, these materials, they are constituted by these very fragile underlying structures, very weak structures. So just by pushing, pulling, shoving and squeezing, what you're doing is you're breaking up those structures, right? So when you tomorrow or tonight, when you brush your teeth, just remember, when you squeeze your tooth toothpaste onto the toothbrush, you just, you know, did a solid to a liquid transition. Okay? Right? Yes. But it's happening at a constant temperature. Not like, you know, water where, you know, you have to change the temperature to see, make it into a gas or a, or a, um, an ice. Yeah. Tell me. No, they can't. Can you fill, fill this up here? You can't. See, it will. <laughs> so, that's because there is some rigidity. You know, that's because of that solid like nature. But as we'll show you, cats can do that. I have nice pictures. Yeah, okay. So, the third material, what was the third material? Was the tomato sauce. So, uh, Kisan fresh tomato sauce, another soft material with an eel stress. So, you know, right, you get the sauce out of the fridge, and what do you do? You whack it to get it to flow. So, what did you just do? You exceeded the eel stress. Right? So, there is nothing wrong with the material. That is how the material was supposed to be. Okay? Because, see, if things, you know, if the toothpaste started flowing out, you know, the moment you open the cap, you will be buying toothpaste every day. Right? So, therefore, you know, uh, companies like Unilever and GE, they spend a lot of money just to make sure that, you know, it flows out just the right amount with the normal squeeze of a, you know, human, you know, of the human fingers. Okay? So, like I've already told you, these materials are viscoelastic. The elasticity arises from the fragile structures. Almost in all the cases that you that I showed you here, the fragile underlying structures, these are really polymers. You know polymers, right? That's what plastic bags are made of. So, these are chain-like molecules, long molecules, and they entangle. But what do they, they entangle? They can also disentangle. But this disentanglement and entanglement can happen under very weak forces, okay? Even the force of, you know, even temperature, okay? Uh, thermal fluctuations can actually make these uh, materials entangle as well as disentangle, okay? They can make the knots break up. Therefore, when you apply small shears, okay, you can actually control flows of these materials that we use every day. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that is, so there are so many different kinds of plastic. Huh? Okay. So see the, what you have as a plastic, I mean, see that is a highly processed material. So the reason why I said it was the same material because see the underlying structure is polymers, but plastics are polyethylene oxide. What we have here is polyacrylamide. So, you know, these are all different plastics with different degrees of cross-linking because see how solid a plastic is or you know a polymer is. So, you know, so like I said, these were linear chain like molecules. You can think of them as flopping around under, you know, because of uh, temperature. But now between the nodes, so these have several nodes along their length and between them they can kind of, you know, attach to each other. It could be a chemical reaction. It could also just be temperature that is, you know, making them tangle up. So, it depends on the, there are all kinds of plastic, you know, polymers, yeah. Okay, so you know, doing theory is very, you know, so writing down equations. So, this is what we call nonlinear rheology because here you are breaking up structures, right? And these are very complicated structures, okay? So, it's very difficult to actually write down equations of, for these materials, but you can do some kind of theoretical uh, work. Uh, for what is called a second order fluid, which is almost a linear fluid. So basically, you know, you're, you're not disrupting the structure much. So for those, those materials, you can, you know, write equations. Now, these materials that I showed you, okay, these are what are called Bingham plastics. Okay, so you, Bingham plastic it's called because, you know, Bingham was a very famous rheologist. So the kind of equation that he wrote for this material was that when stress, the stress that you are applying is less than the yield stress, which is sigma naught, okay, then the viscosity is infinity, 
Okay, but when stress is, when the stress that you apply, when it exceeds the stress, then you can think of it as a Newtonian liquid. So when you are exceeding that sigma naught, okay, so basically when a sigma is less than sigma naught, so sigma naught is basically that squeeze that you applied, okay, then the viscosity is infinite, it does not flow, right. But when sigma is greater than sigma naught, then the Newton's law of viscosity works, okay, yeah. So you are really looking at something like this, so sigma and gamma dot, so this is stress versus shear rate, so Bingham plastic looks like this, okay. So and this is sigma naught, I do not know if you can see it behind that, uh, so this is sigma naught. So you are applying, you are exceeding the sigma naught and it flows like a Newtonian material, but obviously it is not really Newtonian, right. So what is happening here, you know your viscosity changes with shear rate, but here we are assuming a constant shear rate. You also have pseudoplastics for instance, where you know in the model the viscosity is constantly changing with shear rate, okay. But these are phenomenological models. If you want to work out this, you know given a material, you want to work out through the work through the structure and the rheology and you want to come up with all this, it is very hard, okay, exactly. So we do experiments, <laughs> okay, and I mean if you can come up with a model, great, but you know you can only do so much, okay. So uh, I showed you my demos, those were demos, by the way, there are many more demos later on and I would, you know, encourage you to come, you know, after, during coffee and try them out for yourself. Now one thing that for instance we work on in our lab is what is called length scale dependent rheology. So you would have guessed by now that there is a very intimate connection between the microscopic structure of these materials and their bulk flow. By bulk I mean a lot, okay, like large volumes, but how the volumes flow very much like this or this, okay, depends on the structure at the microscopic level. So we actually do experiments in our laboratory where, you know, we measure the structure at the microscopic level and then at high, you know, you zoom it out, zoom it out and you see that depending on where you are zooming in, the dynamics and the structure that you see, they are rather different, okay. Structures in these materials are very hierarchical, okay, and the dynamics also changes depending on, you know, over what length scale you are looking at, okay. And as you know, and as diverse as all these materials seem, I mean, you know, they are very common, but they are super diverse, right, everything looks different. Their flow and deformations do exhibit some very universal features that can be explained by some very, very simple, because you know, like I told you, you can't write down equations for many of them, but there are certain uh, rheological principles that work for pretty much all of them. So now, if you open any book on rheology, this is what you are going to find. I can guarantee, show me one rheology book where this is not written, Panta Rai. This is Greek and it means everything flows. And the person who said it was Heraclitus in 600 BC, okay. So he was a Greek philosopher. So he said everything flows and that is what I am going to show you today, that there is really nothing like a solid or a liquid, everything is Maya. It all depends on how long you are prepared to wait or how quickly you can actually look at it, okay. So by the way, here I should also tell you that there was, uh, so Heraclitus in 600 BC said everything flows, Pantarai. Now even before him, well before him, uh, there was uh, uh, Prophetess Deborah in the book of Judges in the New Testament, okay. So she was the God of the Israelites and she said that the mountains flowed before the Lord, meaning that the Lord has been around for so long that the Lord has seen mountains flow. So you see, and, and by the way, in, in rheology we have a Deborah number, okay, it is a dimensionless number called Deborah number. It is the relaxation time of the material divided by the time scale of ob observation, okay. So rheology does have a theology connection, I love saying that, okay. So anyway, so like I just told you, a liquid can behave like a solid as long as the time scale of measurement is very short, okay. If you can measure picoseconds, this might look like a liquid. Okay. Similarly, a solid can show a liquid-like response if the measurement time is long enough. Okay. Now, so let us look at an experiment, okay, where it was shown that pitch is a liquid. Now, you know pitch, right? Pitch is basically a derivative of R and bitumen and, you know, I mean, that's what we drive our cars over. So that's a solid, right? 
nobody wants to say yes anymore okay because you know this is a trick question so we drive our cars over pitch right now this experiment by the way which is the longest running tabletop experiment according to the guinness book showed that pitch is a liquid okay so let me tell you about the experiment you should tell me if i am is my time up i hope not okay okay so what happened here was so this was an experiment that you can still see if you go to the university of queensland okay so in 1927 sir thomas parnell who was the first professor of physics in the university of uh, queensland he wanted to do an experiment to show students about fluidity and high viscosities and all that okay so he wanted to demonstrate fluid flows and then he came up with this remarkable idea okay he took this uh, Uh, okay so this was his parnell's uh, funnel so he took some pitch which is the same pitch over which we are you know driving our cars okay he heated it up and you know the stem of the funnel was closed okay so he just filled up the funnel with the pitch okay and then till 1933 years they let the pitch consolidate okay because they had heated it up they were you know and like i said pitch is made up of all these macro molecules macroscopic molecules so you want them to kind of settle down that happened for 3 years and in 1930 they cut the stem and what did they see okay so they saw that oh by the way so i should tell you who this person is so this uh, person is john mainstone so he passed away very recently uh, so what people have been seeing since you know for the last 93 years is that uh, every 10 years okay so the the pitch definitely flows because you can see the pitch collecting in a drop okay at the bottom of the funnel and of, after every 10 years the you know just under its own weight the pitch drop it detaches and falls now it started in Uh, 1930 right can anybody guess how many drops have fallen till now i already told you the answer one every 10 years right so nine drops so the last drop fell in 2014 and the next drop will fall any time now and unfortunately nobody has ever seen a drop fall okay so because even you know so they had closed circuit tvs even in 2014 okay because they wanted to see that drop fall however there was a malfunction when the drop fell okay so that's really you know i mean it's poetic injustice but anyway so this time we hope we'll be able to see it and it is a crazy experiment and it got the ignoble award in 2005 so as you know ignoble awards are supposed to be those you know they are awarded to those uh, well this is serious research okay so it's awarded to research which first makes you laugh and then makes you think okay and i mean i think this is a fantastic experiment because what it does is it allows you to measure the viscosity of pitch because you know the poisson equation right the you know the the volumetric flow rate that is actually proportional to the pressure gra gradient under capillary flow so looking at this thickness of the, you know the the basically the the geometric uh, you know the dimensions of the the stem here they actually could calculate the viscosity of pitch using poisson equation and it turned out to be 2.3 into 10 to the power 11 millipascal second who knows the viscosity of water in millipascal second i want the engineering students here to tell me it's 1 millipascal second right so pitch is a liquid but it is a liquid that is 230 billion times more viscous than water okay that's huge we'd call it a solid right it's just that you know these guys waited for 97 years Yeah, you can actually find it in the Guinness Book of World Records. Yeah. Sorry. Ah, uh, so mercury is not. I mean, it's definitely not. So mercury, I can't tell you the viscosity, but it's it's way way lower than this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's nowhere near this. Uh, yeah, I won't give you a number because I don't have the exact number. But yeah, so soft materials, therefore, are materials that show solid-like and liquid-like behaviors at time scales that are accessible in the laboratory. So, in their case, of course, the time scale was 90 years. Now, you know, they did get an ignoble, right? So maybe it was. I'm sure it was worth the wait. Now, I want one of you in the audience to tell me. Can you tell me the inverse case? Where you know your uh, a liquid behaves like a solid. Anybody who's interested in I don't know you know Olympic aquatic events or something. 
you can say anything. Yeah. I've heard that it was simple jump to water, you Yes. If you do the belly flop, so see, well, that's why you need training to dive. Please do not dive if you don't know how to do that. Because see, if you don't enter the water right, okay, if you are accelerating too much at the time of entering, then the water molecules that you are landing on, they behave like concrete because they can't spread out. See, when you are entering the water, you need the water molecules to spread out around your head, right? So, I'll just finish, uh, you know, telling, I mean, talking about this. So, yeah, so now if you do a belly flop, so you just land on the water, you try some shallow diving, okay, you're going to get a concussion, right? That's because, you know, you're, you're, you're you know, and if you're as well big as I am, <laughs> you know, the momentum will be huge. So anyway, so you are uh, basically, you know, so and you're going to land very fast and the water is going to respond like a solid, right? Concussion, broken bones, you know, best case, lots of bruises. Yeah. When I dive into the pool, hmm. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Tell me now. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're right. Right? So, see, that wouldn't happen in a solid, right? Yeah. So, okay, so let's move on. Okay, so what makes a material soft, okay? So like I told you, it's all about time scales, but can we get a slightly better definition? I'm not going to look anymore because uh, soft matter uh, got a Nobel Prize. So this was, well, a second Nobel Prize, but anyway, so by Pierre de Gênes, who used to be in Orsay, who got the Nobel Prize in 1991 for showing that the same kind of mathematical treatments that you require to understand materials like magnets and superconductors, they can be used for polymers and uh, and uh, 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 liquid crystals, okay. This is basically using the technique of order parameters. Hmm? And then of course he had to go to, you know, you know he, he, when he went to accept the Nobel Prize, he had to give a lecture. So the definition of soft matter lies in the first paragraph, okay, of his Nobel lecture and this is what he said. What do we mean by soft matter? Americans prefer to call it complex fluids. This is a rather ugly name which tends to discourage the young students. But it does indeed bring in two of the major features, complexity and flexibility. Now the reason why complexity and flexibility are highlighted in green is because these are very important terms. Uh, Anupam, please tell me when my time is up. You know, I can stop any time. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> because I have also have a, a sufficient amount of information after this. So, okay, so what is structural uh, complexity? So just as life evolved from unicellular to multicellular organisms like us, right, like from the paramecium to me, similarly the study of atoms and molecules have now given way to the study of macromolecules, okay, big molecules, right. I mean initially you are looking at a single, you know, quantum physics, you are looking at ions and atoms, now you are looking at me, I am nothing but a kind of, you know, a structure that is made entirely out of those, you know, atoms and molecules, right? I'm a self-assembled, well, big piece of soft matter, that's what I am, okay? And to, uh, so that was complexity, the second was flexibility. So what Dijen meant was mechanical flexibility, okay? And this is what we've been trying to demonstrate with yield stresses and all that that a very small force on a macromolecular aggregate can give rise to a huge response. And just to kind of, you know, illustrate this a little better, I'm going to give you an example that Dijan gave during his Nobel lecture. And this was basically the method by which the Native Americans in the Amazon basin made boots. Okay, so anybody knows how they made boots? You know, they had these big rubber trees called heavier trees there. Okay, so they just tap a hole in that heavier tree and the sap flows out, okay. Now what is sap? Sap is polymers, these are linear chains in some kind of fluid, okay. Now the Americans, uh, the Native Americans, they would just, you know, take that sap and which was a liquid because these were just linear chains that were not touching, okay, and they would just kind of paint it on their feet, okay. They would just brush it on their feet and lo and behold, it would solidify into a boot. And why did that happen? Because the oxygen in, in the atmosphere, it is
it is actually way more reactive than you think. So what the oxygen did was it induced a chemical reaction. So if you think of many chains like this, okay, so this is the rubber that flowed out the sap. Now the exposure to the oxygen made the, you know, the polymer chains in sap form networks. So you ended up with a rigid material that was your boot. Okay, so that's a liquid to a solid transition under a weak chemical reaction. Now, in this case, you saw liquid to solid under a weak mechanical push, right? So you are basically using different kinds of uh, procedures to achieve flow when you want it or to achieve solidity whenever you want it. Now, there is something interesting because he says I have no time limit. So now in these boots, the same oxygen that gave rise to these, you know, connections and the rigidity, that same oxygen ends up severing, okay, breaking these. So then the boot melts, the boot melts in 20 minutes and that makes you susceptible to all the leeches, right. So then it took the serendipity of Charles Goodyear okay, in 1850 to figure out that you can do the same reaction, okay, except that you boil sap not in oxygen but in sulphur and this is what is called vulcanization and for those of you, you know, who belong to my generation, there were Goodyear tires everywhere, right, so that is rubber. So when you boil sap, you know, this kind of, you know, latex with sulphur, you get a material that is a rubber and that can really stand the test of time. It is, it lasts forever, okay. So serendipity, soft matter, mess, you know, they are very uh, interlinked. So, so and now soft materials again, okay, this is not what we do in the lab, but we use soft materials because these are good candidates as sensors. I can talk about all these later as soft robots, as micro grippers and as adaptive and self-healing materials. We for instance work on certain materials called micro gels that can actually be used to, you know, so with we make layers of different stiffnesses and then they can actually be, they actually respond when you change the temperature and by doing that you can actually use it to grip tiny things, okay. So there is a lot of technology that can come out of this, what you know, I am trying to sound like, you know, a lot of fun, yes Lakshya. It's okay, I, I, I'll try to hear. Absolutely, yes, totally. So the, what I'd like you to do is, you know, when you use anything at home today, when you're cooking, you know, if you're making idli batter, everything is uh, non-Newtonian, okay? And I'm going to, well, my students are going to show you an experiment, okay, on the non-Newtonian nature of idli batter. So, <laughs> try it at home. Yeah. Yes. Huh. Hmm. Yeah, it's very difficult though we do have a paper where we did it. I still don't understand why we did it. We, I mean, we also assumed uh, many things but uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a, an approximation. See, because viscosity changes with external forces in ways that are sometimes not even obvious. You know, and not just that, you know, these materials have memory. You know, they remember what you did to them yesterday. You see, so I mean, these are very, very difficult experiments to, you know, materials to write equations for. But I mean, you can do certain approximations, you can get some features, not all. Huh. Hmm. Yeah, so again, you know, I, we have some work, uh, these are very technical things, so you can use, you know, techniques like nematohydrodynamics, for instance, you know, to explain certain instabilities, so yeah, that, it can be done, but you know, it can only do so much, because, you know, as an experimentalist, I can see that it only models a subset of the things that, you know, I would expect to see. Okay, so now the experiments start. So this is an experiment that was done in my lab by my ex-student uh, Rajiv. So he finished his PhD in 2014 and Prakhyat who was a visiting student. So uh, what do you think we have here? So what we have here is cornstarch, which is basically, you know, so this was, this came from Mahabazar, right? 
So we took basically 50% of this. So you know where cornstarch comes from, right? It's the starch that comes out of the kernel of corn. Okay, and then you just grind it into a powder, and we use it in the in in ch Chinese restaurants, for instance, to thicken soup. Right? It's 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 uh, biodegrade. I mean, it's it's an inorganic inorganic material. Okay, it's food stuff. So now what we've done here, well, there's my pointer. So here, okay, as well as here, my students have kindly made a cornstarch suspension for me. Is you know, so we basically have about 50% of cornstarch which we have mixed with 50% of normal water, that is it. You can do it in the kitchen tonight, okay. And we have ended up with something that looks like this. Yes, yes, cornstarch does though. So inorganic was only clay. So actually, uh, well, I mean technical details. So uh, clay was the only inorganic uh, material that I showed you. After that, everything is organic because it's polymers, right? And polymers are, except cornstarch, but then cornstarch is a carbohydrate. So that is also organic, yeah. You know, organic molecules are bigger. So, you know, they make better soft materials. So this is what we have, okay? So this is cornstarch. It's basically just this powder in water. And before Swapnil comes and helps me with an experiment, I'm going to show you what we do there. So that is basically the same material, but in a Petri dish. And we've actually kept it on a, uh, an amplifier speaker, you know, on, on a speaker, on a two-in-one speaker, okay, that's it. And uh, we played some loud Punjabi music, which, you know, don't worry, I'll spare you that. So, you know, it's vibrating underneath, okay, and then just look what happens. You see, do you see the Faraday ripples? You see the ripples on water, right? That is liquid-like behavior, right? That's what you'd expect on, you know, a sea when there's a wind. Right, so that's now what Prakhyat has done there is that Prakhyat has taken this hollow glass rod and has blown some air through it. And what happened then was you found these persistent holes, and at the edges of the persistent holes, okay, you had the, the volume fraction became very high, and that's when around the holes the cornstarch started behaving like a solid. So it's just jumping up and down like a ball, okay, or like rubber. It's like an elastic material and we call these cornstarch uh, monsters and again I'm going to spare you this but the record that we had was 16 minutes of this happening. So as long as you keep it vibrating, this is going to continue, okay. So there you see together the liquid and the solid like material. So whereas here, you know, which is outside over here in the Petri dish where the volume fraction is lower. So you see the ripples very much like ripples on water but here is jumping up and down just like a ball, okay, like a solid like material. Now, okay, this keeps, okay, so now the cornstarch demo, I need a volunteer and Swapnil Roy here, so he insisted that I call him Swapnil Roy, so he's going to do one thing for me, so, so this is the same material, I'm going to stop this, this noise is annoying, so, and then, so what you, so this is, you know, this is what it looks like, it's kind of a pasty material, so what Swapnil Roy will now do is, you know, he will first stir it very, very slowly, very gently, and then really hard, and he's going to tell you what he sees, you can maybe face the audience and do it here, yeah. Very, very gently initially. Yeah. So when you did it, when you stirred it gently, it's easy, right? Yes. But when you stir it hard, it doesn't move, it becomes a solid. So cornstarch is a material which becomes a liquid when you treat it very gently. But if you stir it very vigorous, vigorously, it just solidifies. And I'm going to tell you why that happened right now. Just remember this. And I'm going to show you another fun video. Uh, I thought, should I pass this around? I mean, I could. <laughs> okay. I thought if there were too many people, you know, we don't want to lose our beakers and uh, yeah. So, so yeah. So while we move ahead, you can just, you know, try stirring it first gently and then very, very hard. And now, so this is again something that I flicked off YouTube. So here again, this is something that you must do in your home, which is make a cornstarch pool. I don't know if we can do it today because, you know, it just gets really messy, but I don't know, that depends on the audience. So you want to do it? No. No. Okay. So let me first start the video. Yeah. So here, you know, they have this bucket of cornstarch. 
So tap water and a lot of cornstarch. So I'm going to jump in and over and then I'll stand up. Watch out, AJ. I don't know how to decrease the volume. And then if I put my foot in slowly. It's the same material. Down I go. Oh, yeah. that feel lovely. So when you, when you go over it quickly, it's, you know, supports your weight. Yeah. But when you go in gently, you can save. Can you get out? So no, come back all kids want to do this obviously. Okay, so we're back. I've mixed in more starch. So now he's added now more cornstarch to make it thicker. See how nice and snotty it is falling off there? And if you look closely when I do the shovel on the side, yeah, let's you can see it just kind this, of yeah? peel away. So we'll come and back. I'm showing how liquid it is. I just set the shovel in. It goes all the way down to the bottom. Pull it out. You see, it's already getting difficult. Like you see in that cornstarch. Uh, you see? So you have clumps that are breaking yeah. off. No. Or if I put it down at the bottom and I try to pull it up, you'll see the whole bucket move. Yeah? <laughs> so if you kind of sure jerk it with a shove, you know, the shovel so, is just getting, uh, now we're just getting uh, stuck. So we can do a kid hop. Go ahead, Nicole. Solid. And Adam? If you, if you jump fast enough, you can actually jump on it for a long time. So you cool. see these YouTube videos yeah. where people actually run over a swimming pool filled with cornstarch. See? So now you can actually, you can dance on it, but the moment you stop, you sink. He sank. Oh, that feels good? Oh, it feels just Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Exactly. It's the way they self-assemble, exactly. And the way they self-assemble depend on the interactions between them. Now the thing is, you know, in the lab we can even modify those interactions. So my wonderful students there, they've become chemists, okay, because we can make our own molecules, macromolecules, we can make patches, okay, of different charges for, so you can actually, you know, you can, you can uh, graph things on the surfaces and you can completely change the interaction. And sometimes you can change interactions if your molecules are charged, macromolecules are charged, you can actually completely change the interaction just by adding certain things. For instance, you add salt and then, you know, it becomes solid-like for reasons we can discuss later. Yes. The concrete is exactly this. Yeah. But cornstarch is just easier to make because see to look at the liquid like behavior of concrete is a little difficult at room temperature. Okay. Quicksand is exactly like this. So that's a very good observation. So I'll tell you. So you've seen all the different ingredients that make quicksand, but quicksand brings them all together. So one is of course uh, sand, the other is clay. Okay, and there's water and there's salt. So now clay, like I told you, these are charged macromolecules. Okay, so therefore, you know, they can kind of do this, but these are very fragile. And you also have, and, and so you, have, you can think of clay as making these networks and in quicksand, the sand is between the pores. Okay, it's in between the pores of the clay. Now, so if you fall on quicksand, why do you get sucked? Because you've broken up all the structures because it's fragile. So if you fall on quicksand, you have to promise me that you're not going to move. Because if you do not move, you're not going to shear thin it, okay? You're not going to break up the structures. So you can actually float on quicksand. But the moment you start waving your arms and feet around, what, which is your first instinct, of course, you're basically breaking up the quicksand and you're falling right through because you've broken up all the, uh, the structures and then, you know, the sand comes and falls on you and that's why people can die. You know, because sand is, you know, I mean, it is, there's a lot of sand in quicksand because the network that is formed by the clays, the pores are huge. So there's a lot more sand than there is clay. Okay. So, so we even tried making quicksand in the lab, by the way. So I don't know if you are aware of, uh, you know, physics journals, but there's a very famous journal called Nature. So, you know, where they made quicksand and they actually put it under a machine called a rheometer. We have two of those in our lab where all you do is you apply a stress and you measure a strain or you apply a strain and you measure a stress and that's how you calculate the rheology, okay? So, 
like I and you know you can like I said you can make a pool of cornstarch I don't know if we can today but we do have a lot of cornstarch here that you are welcome to come and play with. So when you run fast on a pool of cornstarch lots of YouTube videos it can support your weight but when you stand on the same pool you are going to sink okay. Now when you push pull or stir cornstarch hard and fast as some of you are seeing it behaves like a solid but when you stir it gently it is a liquid. Now why does this happen right? Uh, okay. So the cornstarch suspensions that we have they are very dense and you know these dense cornstarch suspensions are also called oobleck as immortalized by Dr. Seuss in his uh, beautiful beautiful book Bartholomew and the oobleck where there was this you know the oobleck was really cornstarch but you know it was kind of uh, uh, depicted as this green colored monster that was completely out of control. Okay, so anyway, so what does oobleck look like? So this is another electron microscope image. Okay, so again here you are using electrons because you want to look down at very very small length scales and here electron acts as a wave. So you can actually take pictures and this is what a cornstarch particle looks like. It is an irregular disc about 15 microns across, okay, but it is a disc, remember that. And uh, what happens when you apply forces on cornstarch? So if you so if you look here, so when you apply a shear rate, when the so this is the rate of shear that you are applying, and this is the viscosity that is being plotted, and these are this is my well artist depiction of cornstarch. So that those are the red uh, particles of cornstarch. Blue is the water medium. So at very low shear rates, nothing happens. Okay, the cornstarch is nicely dispersed; they are not touching. Now, when you apply, when you increase the shear rate a little bit between the two dashed lines. Constant particles are discs, remember they are size anisotropic. So they start aligning along the direction of flow. And you know, you know, when you swim, for instance, you know, you align along the streamlines, right? And that's, you know, and you can, well, you can swim better, right? It's easier to go downstream than upstream. So for the same reason, when Swapnil and whoever has the constarch right now, when you, uh, when you stir it gently, it feels like a liquid, it just feels like a liquid perhaps a little more viscous than water. But when you try to shear it very hard what happens? So that is when you go rightward on this axis when you are increasing the shear rate these irregular cornstarch particles they start jamming into each other very much like a traffic jam. Okay? So they just keep you know they jam into each other and then they cannot come apart so you can think of this. You know, so under very high shears, the cornstarch is really forming clumps of cornstarch particles and then it behaves like a solid, which is why it gets so hard to stir it when you shear it very hard. Okay? Ah, okay. So, I am not sure what yellow is, but I mean yellow and red are all cornstarch particles. Blue is the liquid like medium. I think the yellow here, I think these are the clusters that are forming, yeah. So, these are the clusters. So, see, I mean, uh, these are, they, well, there are different schools. For instance, science and school will say something else, but you know, so they say that it is a dyna, you know, it is a, it's a front that propagates. There is another, you know, it is like a shear thickening front that propagates. There is another school that says that, you know, because cornstarch is in water, uh, when particles come close to each other, they form water bridges and they form hydro clusters. Okay? So exactly which is the correct picture, I think, you know, we will be arguing about that forever. So, okay. So now, uh, we want to stir our polymer something like this and I hope you will all come back to stir this. Okay? Uh, we, we stir this and you know so this is a polymer which means that it is these uh, you know long molecules and they are highly cross linked. So these form networks okay? like the networks that I drew here but these are kind of tight networks. So the elasticity remember is coming from the network structure but because the network is weak you can do many things to it. So now when I take water and I stir it and I have a picture there. This is what the meniscus looks like, right? It's convex downwards, right? So this is, you know, so this is a stirrer. It's so what we are going to use eventually is a drilling machine, you know, because you want big speeds. So this is what it looks like. Now see what happens when you take polymer and when you do the same experiment. So this is basically polymer. It's polyacrylamide with a food dye. Everything, you know, pretty much everything can come from uh, food world. So, and this is what happens. So, this is done by uh, Sayantan and Sonali there. I don't know if Jashim also participated. He also participated. I'm really sorry I haven't acknowledged you. But uh, so, this is what is called an Eisenberg, Weisenberg effect. 
So unlike the water where the meniscus is like this, you will see that when you do the same experiment for polymer, the polymer climbs the rod. Okay. So have a look at this. Okay, it played a, uh, okay. So there you go. So okay, so the drilling gun is basically it's rotating. You can see the polymer uh, climbing up. Very, very different from the water, right? Now why does that happen? Because see, when you're stirring the polymer with the drilling gun, okay, you're generating these circular lines of force. Now see, when we have water, okay, this is not water, right? So the circular lines of force are really like rubber bands. So they have elasticity. And just like a rubber band would, it just snaps inward. And as it snaps inward, because of the elasticity, it snaps inward and it drives the uh, polymer up the rod. And you can do it with egg yolk, you can do it with idli batter, you can do it with cake batter. Okay, and uh, like Sayantan wrote, and I really like that, that you know, it, uh, you think it's a liquid, but it can actually climb a rod like a monkey. Okay, huh. so, uh, may, okay, I, maybe I'll play the video again. So see, you are, by stirring it really hard, you're generating these lines, right, the circular lines of uh, flow. Now, they have elasticity. So, it's going to constantly want to contract. So, because it contracts, just like an elastic band would, it basically, it's just, you know, driving things up. And you can actually see, so, you know, this is, of course, this particular polymer, it goes up only that much. But on YouTube, you know, there are these, uh, I've forgotten the polymer, I think poly polyacrylamide, but cross-linked, you know, with maybe much more borax or much more rigid, they can actually climb feet, you know, at least a foot, you know, just by stirring it. So, again, this is something you can do at home, okay? So I told you all this, uh, next experiment, the Barros effect. Okay, so again, we are going to show you this. It's the same polymer doing a slightly different thing. So if you just take the polymer in a bottle with an orifice, okay, with a hole, huh, very much like this, but with a much smaller, this is just water. And if you squeeze it out, if you have the same polymer in here, you are going to see that as the polymer exits the orifice, it swells. Now, why does that happen? I'm going to sh let me first show you the video. Now, if water does the same thing, it's not going to swell, right? Because water has no structure. It's going to fall with the exact same diameter as the dot diameter of the orifice. So now, let me just show the, so here also I might have missed out Jashim. So, sorry Jashim. So here, can you see it swelling at the orifice? So for certain polymers, it can actually swell up four to five times the size of the orifice. Now, why does that happen? Okay, it happens because polymers are organic, but these are polymers that are made in a water medium. Okay, so these polymers, okay, so now, you know, organic molecules, macromolecules, they don't like water, right? So when they are in water, they are kind of, you know, coiled up. They make globules. Now, so in the bottle, you have globules like this. But then the molecules, you know, because you're squeezing them, they have to exit the bottle, right? They have to exit through this tiny orifice. And to exit, they line up here. Because remember, these are soft materials. So what you really get is a coil to a linear chain conformation, uh, change in conformation, okay? So because of the shear, because the shear rate at the orifice is much higher, it, the polymers that were globules here, they just stretch out under shear. Okay, so they, but then the moment they come out, they coil back again, right? And so that's why your liquid swells. So yeah, and that would never happen for water. Okay, I think we are kind of done. So because we started with sand, let us, uh, sorry, I took a bit more time than I should have. So because we started with uh, sand, let us end with sand. So sand is also viscoelastic and I told you why. Right? Because, you know, you can walk on a beach, but then it can also flow under gravity. Now, what is this? This is an hourglass, right? So I'm going to ask my last ever wonder question. So the last ever wonder question is that, have you ever thought why we use sand and not a very, very viscous material like honey? Sand 
Well, it is not exactly that Swapnil. So, what happens is see in see because what does a what, what does a an hourglass do? It wants to measure time, right? Now, to measure time, so how do you measure time here? You measure time because the sand is basically falling from the top bottom compartment to the orifice, right? Now, because you want to measure time, you want this rate of flow of sand to be constant, right? It can't just be more first and then become slow because, you know, then it is not a very reliable way of estimating. Now, for water, what would happen? Have you heard of hydrostatic pressure? So, for water, for any normal Newtonian liquid, the rate of flow would be proportional, okay, to the height of the liquid on top of it. So, if the height of the liquid is more, the liquid is going to flow faster. If the height of the liquid is less, the liquid flow is going to become really slow, okay. But that does not happen on sand, with sand. Because unlike a Newtonian liquid, where the pressure is really, you know, the weight is supported by the base of the water, of the Newtonian liquid, in the case of sand, the weight of the sand can actually be supported by the sides. And that is because sands act weird, be, you know, so sands in sand, you know, the stresses can actually be transmitted through a network of force chains, okay. So, these are basically the frictional contacts. So, you can think of, you know, so if this is all sand, okay. So, basically, you know, wherever they are touching, stresses will only propagate through them. And therefore, you know, they will, they can actually propagate from one side of the container to the other, thereby shielding, okay, the part of the sand below. And therefore, it does not, you know, the rate of flow of sand does not depend on the height. And these are called force chains. People have done these spectacular experiments where they have actually, they have, you know, they have imaged these force chains. Because the granular matter that they used, these were, uh, by, you know, disks that were, that were birefringent under forces. So, you know, when, so depending on the force getting transmitted, you could actually see the networks because the colors were changing. So, particles that were supporting higher shears, they had a different color. I mean, it, it really magnificent. And these force chains, as they are called, they are also dynamic, which means that they make, they break, and then they make again, okay. But the net result of all this is that the weight is actually mostly held up by the sides. As a result of that, the flow rate of sand is constant. Hmm? And therefore, you know, you need that for a timekeeping device. You need a constant flow rate. Okay, and I should tell you here that any material which is a conglomeration, a collection of discrete solid microscopic, you know, particles, these are called granular matter. And well, there are many other uh, granular materials. So, mixed nuts, we will do a different experiment with it. Corn flakes, rice, pills, you know, as long as they are interacting through frictional contacts and as long as there are many of them, they are all called granular matter. Can anybody tell me, a, you know, like an astronomical scale granular matter? The asteroid belt, okay. So, yeah, so, okay. So, now we will do an experiment called the Brazil nut experiment and I do hope it works. <laughs> so, uh, now let me tell you uh, some history, you know, I mean, so I found out about the Brazil nut effect maybe about 10 years ago, but when I was in the US, I had actually observed it, but I never asked the what if question. So, so when I used to go back, when I was in Baltimore and I used to go back from, you know, the campus to my home, which was quite far away, I had to drive on the highway. And on the way, I would just stop by the supermarket and I would buy a wonderful cereal called Post Raisin Bran Crunch and cranberry also. And then, you know, I would just put it in my boot and then I would come home and when I opened the cereal, I would see that all the heavier particles like the cranberry and the raisins, they were all on top. Now, that is weird, right? Because you think that the heavier particle should drop to the bottom. Why is it coming out on top? So, that is the bristle nut effect which I found out much later. So, basically, it is called the bristle nut effect because if you take a bowl of mixed nuts, lots of things, you know, to see on YouTube tonight. And when you shake, and bristle nut is a very large nut. So, if you take cashews and pistas and moomphalies and bristle nut and I have a walnut here and you shake it, you will always see that the biggest particle comes out on top. Very counterintuitive because you always learn from thermodynamics that if you took two, you know, things that mix well and you shake it, you jostle it, they should mix. Granular material, they demix, and I am going to show you this. So, what do you see here? Rice. This is rice. And uh, do you see this brown thing here? Hmm? 
hmm? you, yeah it's kind of you know uh, camouflaged by the rice it's a walnut it's a walnut akrot huh, in a shell so now what i'm going to do is very much like that bottle there i'm going to thump it the idea is i'm going to get the walnut out there you go okay so this is the brazil nut effect you can come do it later i'm going to keep it here we have other brazil nut effects so this is basically walnut and rajma so this is all stuff that you will get in your hostel kitchen or you know anywhere and here we have a stainless steel ball and sand and by the way this is an again a granular experiment that we stole from shri madhusudana but you know you are welcome to do that too that that shows you the breaking and the forming of force chains so yeah so let me just show you this video uh, i keep losing this uh, so what is happening here right i mean what was really happening here is that when you were thumping it you were setting up these convection rolls okay but these are granular convection rolls and like i told you about drainer dilatancy when you apply stresses these materials dilate okay and as a result of the dilate dilation you are actually forming lots of holes and then through the holes the walnut goes up okay so i'll just show that to you again because i missed it wait uh, okay so here i mean again this is something from youtube so it's basically sand okay he he first put a stainless steel ball 25 mm uh, size just loads it in sand and does exactly what i did with the akrot and the rice okay so you just kind of you know beat it up a little bit let the convection rolls just kind of you know carry the akrot to the top in this case a steel ball okay and uh, many of you at least you know my grandmother maybe your great great grandparents yeah so this is uh, winnowing of rice where you basically shake rice you know in the wind and then the the rice grains they separate from the husk or the chaff right so soft matter is all around you and we are constantly using the rheological principles some we just need to think a little more about you know what is going on so by the way you know this is just a little uh, uh, trivia so it was first actually really observed and recorded during the industrial revolution in europe okay in the 18th century uh, i'm sorry in the ninth in the 18th century right so because you know at that time because there was a lot of industrial production going on you know lots of coal was necessary so coal used to be transported in wagons and people had noticed then that you know the little pieces of you know there was the segregation between the big pieces of coal and the, and the little pieces of coal and that was because of brazil nut effect and because chunks of coal they are granular matter so now i hope i've been able to convince you that soft matter is fun i'll only know that you found it fun if you come back and do these demos now there are two books that i really wanted to show you highly recommended so this one is a book by uh, roberto piazza who's in the university of milan um, and by the way this is what he said and i think this is very very you know it really applies to copy with curiosity that physics should be made simple enough to be amusing but not so trivial as to spoil the fun and the second book here so this book by the way is called uh, it's called soft matter the stuff that dreams are made of so here's a bubble okay bubbles many bubbles together form soft matter and like i said i am basically a walking talking you know soft matter assembly and the second book is by is called sensitive matter by michel mitov who's in the university uh, cote di azur in nice so by the way he's our uh, copy with curiosity speaker on 13th august because he'll be in bangalore in august so uh, yeah this is also a beautiful beautiful book and uh, it's not just books so there are many of these you also need to read some very very interesting papers so one is the pitch drop experiment okay it got the ignoble so these are all the ignoble experiments but you know they are so much fun so the first one is the pitch drop experiment which i already told you about ignoble 2005 the second uh, experiment you know which was actually it ended up as a chem phys chem paper and this is actually done by a friend of mine in uh, uc irvine called gregory wise okay so he he boiled an egg and then unboiled it <laughs> and he got the ignoble for that in 2015 if you want the it's a fantastic experiment okay it's all chemistry if you want the details i'm happy to share it with you there's also a lot of resources on the internet and as sam told you uh, i like cats very much so i have to mention this paper 
okay, the Ig Nobel Award 2017 for this delightful paper by M. A. Fardin in the Rheology Bulletin called the on the Rheology of Cats. And here it is, a cat can be a solid as well as a liquid, okay, so here you see a cat behaving like a spring that is an elastic uh, material and here you can see the cat that is basically taking the shape of the container which in this case is a sink. So that is a cat behaving like a liquid, okay and so believe it or not this person has actually calculated relaxation time scales and Deborah numbers for different kinds of activities and also ends with the comment that you know it is not only a liquid but house cats who only do important cat business like sleeping and eating, they are really gases because they become compressible. <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. So, and there are many things that I could not show you. So, one was the K effect. So, if you take shampoo and you just kind of, you know, let it, uh, you know, you just let it slide over more shampoo on an inclined plane, you can actually see these lassos that are coming out. I will not tell you why it is, I will tell you maybe you know if we have a conversation but it is beautiful. The reason why we do not usually see it is because A normally we do not really spill shampoos on inclined planes and number two is that these lassos, the time scales, the kind of the lifetime of these lassos are much faster okay, than the, the eye can recognize. And the other um, one that I did not show you, I do have videos at the end, is that of fano flow where you can actually siphon off a viscoelastic material but your syringe or your, you know, your syringe does not touch your liquid. So once the liquid starts coming into your syringe, you can actually lift your syringe and the flow continues. That is because these materials have what is called extensional viscosity. So when you stretch these materials, they become solid. So then it really becomes like, you know, pulling up a string. So that is it, I am done. So, uh, okay, so this was supposed to be fun, but we also do serious business. Uh, so you can have a look at our website here. So we look at suspensions, we look at colloids, polymers, microgels, you know, we also look at uh, biological systems in RRI. There is one of us who is also looking at liquid crystals. So you know, please come to RRI, look at our websites, acknowledgements, of course, the ICTS team. Thank you very much for having me here. Anupam, your enthusiasm is infectious. <laughs> and uh, of course, the fantastic people at the Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium, I, I'm not a new person here and every time I've come here, I've had a tremendous amount of fun. Special mention to Sri Madhusudana, you know, who makes me feel like, you know, I should be enjoying what I'm doing much more, okay, I'm not enjoying it enough. And of course, the fantastic members of the Rio, the Rio DLS lab out there, you know, I think they should take a bow because they have helped me with all the demos and special mentions to all the PhD students who are here now. Well, Chandeshwar actually just defended his thesis, so he's a Dr. Chandeshwar, not a PhD student anymore. Uh, Sayantan Sonali, Jaseem, Chandeshwar, Vaibhav, you know, for, well, what they do every day. And uh, there will be, like I told you, some demos after this. It's all here. Some of this will also be transferred here. We have some really cool things here that I showed you in videos. And uh, thank you for your attention. Apologies because I know I took a lot of time. We still can have some questions from I'm the fine. It's almost here. 6 o'clock, but that I'm fine. <laughs> if you have any question, you can raise your hand. Else I'll just... Yeah. Huh. If you think of sand as a flowing liquid in the hourglass, for instance, in and a, if you can, in, a, in, in the hourglass, hour yeah. if you can measure its viscosity, uh, it will be much lesser than pitch and much yes. more than exactly. water? Exactly. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That's yeah. 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 Can I ask a question? At some point you said sand swells. Yes. Why does it happen? Sand does not swell really. See, because sand has a lot of excluded volume. Right. So, you can think of sand as you know these uh, grains, okay, uh, irregular shaped grains with some pores in between, okay. So, this is for dry sand, I mean well even for wet sand it works, but so now when you apply a pressure on sand, sand swells because you know you can think of this lever motion that is happening between the sand particles. So, there is actually as a result of you know the, the friction between the grains of sand, Okay, uh, the net result of that is there is a volumetric expansion. 
as a result of which the pores between the sand. So, you know in a no stress condition basically you can think of it as pores that are much smaller, but you know when you are applying a compression or you are applying a shear or a push or a pull or whatever, then the pores actually expand. So, actually you can feel it when you walk on wet sand, you will actually see that some of the sand ends up on your foot, right. If you are walking on sand, you know if you are walking on clay, the clay does not land up on your foot, right, but the sand does because it is swelling and it swells and it actually you know comes onto your foot. See there are many other you know, so there are many things, see I did not give you a very clear answer there here. Okay, it is very difficult to quantify these, this is a qualitative answer. See for instance, there are certain things that we have no clue why it happens. One is that you would have seen ridge dunes in a desert, right, where you have these ridges of you know, like piles, heaps of sand in ridges, but you know they are actually separated by very fixed wavelengths. Now exactly what it, obviously it has something to do with the wind. But you know getting a very clear correlation, what exactly, what are the exact parameters that set that wavelength, it is not clear. Okay, so uh, we will take few questions from online. Sure. And yeah. So uh, there is one question by Sejil, she asks, my question is can soft matters, can soft material store memory? You mentioned they do, they absolutely do. So, Sejal, they absolutely do and that is because you know their uh, viscosity. So, remember I told you that you know one of the parameters with which uh, you can uh, characterize soft matters is viscosity. Now, for water, you know viscosity is constant and like we mentioned, it is 1 millipascal second. Now, and you know for honey, it would be more, for silicon oil, it can be even lower than water, it can be even higher than water depending on you know the size of the you know the, the oil molecule. But now in the case of uh, viscoelastic material, the viscosity, the coefficient of viscosity is not a constant for a given material. It depends not just on the rate of strain that you are applying, it also depends on the history of deformation. So as a result of that, if I take a material and I apply a stress of 1 Pascal on it and if I take the same material and I apply two, you know, I, I, I apply 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 Pascals as you know, two experiments one after the other, I'd get very different strain responses. So yes, they do store memory. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then there is a comment or a question by Nishant. Does they have? Does they behave as a material having non-linear response? Uh, that's what I showed you. So everything that I showed you was a non-linear response in the sense that it cannot be uh, it cannot be explained just by Hooke's law or just by Newton's law of viscosity, not only do you need to combine Hooke's law and Newton's law, you also need you know other non-linear terms to be able to even go close to describing a part of what I showed you. Okay, uh, thanks. And then there is a question by Utpal, what is a polymer? Okay, so a polymer is an or organic molecule, these are long molecules, so these are uh, you know, um, so polyethylene oxide for instance, you know carbons and hydrogens and you know oxygens and you know, so they basically you can think of a polymer as being made up of many small monomers. So one monomer is many carbon, hydrogen and oxygen molecules and then they just basically string together with using covalent bonds to make one long polymer. And now the length of the polymer could be different. So for instance, you know DNA is a kind of polymer, it is a charged polymer. So if you take for instance, you know and we normally look at the, we do not talk of polymers in terms of length, but we talk of them in terms of molecular weight. So the more the number of molecules, you know the monomers that are strung together to make a polymer, the more is a molecular weight. So in the case of a DNA for instance, a human DNA is so many, you know hundreds of thousands of uh, Daltons. But you know, I have worked with calf thymus DNA. So calf thymus DNA is a lot shorter than that. So basically you have this unit and you are repeating this unit many, many times to form a linear molecule that is a polymer. And they are usually also flexible because you know, you need them to entangle and unentangle. Thank you. So uh, you have a question. 
so you told that uh, soft matters can be used for sensing applications and sensors so can you please basically describe how it works ha huh. so one thing that we make in our lab is you know we make these uh, material i don't do anything my students do everything okay i just get to pass it off as you know my own work so we make uh, not just in our lab even in science and lab they make these thermo responsive polymers okay so well these are called microgels so these uh, these are basically a, everything is a polymer okay so these are polymers that are kind of you know you can think of polymers as these chains that are entangled right now at a very high temperature you know you can think of them as you know like a congealed mess of polymers you know like they are kind of collapsed polymers but when you decrease the temperature they can actually imbibe water and they can swell okay Uh, so what happens there is the material goes from hydrophobic to hydrophilic okay so before it was hydrophobic which mean, meant that the material hated water so it wouldn't let water in so it was kind of coiled together very much like in that dyswell experiment that i told you right but then as the temperature reduces the material starts liking water for certain chemical details okay and as a result of that it starts you know absorbing water and then it can swell up now in certain for certain polymers for instance that we make you know it swells exactly at 32 degrees okay so it can sense the temperature in certain other materials you know there are other sensors that you can make with soft matter where you can sense pressures That's so, uh, the, when you were studying the concept, yeah, so the it became harder, harder and harder, uh, because of the strain, uh, in the thickening, yeah, uh, because it was become hard, yeah. right. But in water also, you can make vortices, hmm. and also some of these effects, like there is the surface tension. And, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. what are the things that are very different in water, the strain water, then liquid? Yeah, I, I think the main thing would be that there is no structure formation. you know you do have hydrogen bonds yes but you know those are dynamic bonds you know i mean they are kind of but you know you 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 can't really break them up you know i mean well basically i should say that mechanical forcing does not really make a change to the structure of water as it does here see and here of course even the structures that they form they are much larger than water but you know hurricane for example in gas huh the density does change right really not the visc so here the density can yeah, change of course exactly yeah here you need the mechanical moduli to change yeah I, i'm sorry i shouldn't be uh, keeping you but no, uh, if i ask you the question uh, so there is there is no nothing like there are only three states of this thing mm. liquid solid and gas but there is a whole continuum there is one state <laughs> there is only one state or yeah. a continuum of states can you say i would say so yeah, yeah. i would okay. definitely say so okay. yeah thank you so much. very nice talk thank you thank so you. much <laughs> okay so if there are no more questions uh, let's thank the speaker thank you for the wonderful talk thank you but please come back and do the experiments because yes. you know uh, we came here yesterday and today just to make sure that you know experiments work yeah please feel feel free to come and um, experience soft matter